Amen. It's a good day to be in the house of the Lord, right? And so hopefully you guys, we're, we're in the third week of this series, The Good Life. You guys are figuring out how to experience the good life. So hopefully everyone is beginning to kind of catch this and you're beginning to experience this, right? It's not just to hear about it, but it's beginning to experience it. So if you're, if you're joining us online, man, welcome. We're so glad you guys are a part of the service. And uh, today we're going to kind of unpack a, a third part of this. But uh, last week we had an incredible Sunday with uh, Pastor Ken Gay, and he is, uh, that's kind of the good life, just getting to hear him preach. I mean, he just, he's funny, he's fun to listen to, but man, I'm telling you, he brings the Word of God, and he brings the, uh, the challenge to us. And he talked about being a cheerful giver last week, and so hopefully, you know, that's been our mentality all week, not just for that day, you know, because I think sometimes we think, hey, this is just for the moment. No, it's just, for, this is how we're supposed to live, and, and so the good life is how we live. And so what we saw with Ken was he talked about being a cheerful giver. And, and he gave us a couple of things to walk away with last week that I, I thought were good. So he said, we, we enjoy the good life when, we, when God reacts to our giving. And so whenever we realize that, you know, God looks at the heart. He looks at how we give and why we give. And, you know, it's not what we give. You know, sometimes it's really the heart. You know, it's what's behind that. And so maybe for you, even last week as you gave, you gave with a, a different kind of heart. And, uh, and Pastor Ken did a great job of, of teaching that and challenging us and, and, and helping us to understand what is the, the true you know, posture of giving, you know, that we give because we want to be a part of something special. You know, we want to, be, we want to give our all to God. And, uh, man, he just did a really good job with that. And so God reacts to our giving. In other words, you know, he kind of even illustrated that, hey, you're kind of like, you know, God's walking through there and he looks over and he goes, wow, look at that. And he gets the, we get the attention of the God of the universe by how we give our heart. And I thought that was incredible. Great job with that. And then he also said when we get lost in the offering, when we get so into the offering and we want to be a part of something in such a way that we give everything that we got, we, we give it all. You know, we give our life. And, and for us, when we give our life to Christ, we say, God, I want you to have everything. Everything I've got is yours. That is a cheerful giver. And that, I'm telling you, that's, that's part of the good life. That is the good life. And so he talked about a couple things last week that I thought were interesting. And many of you guys may not have uh, caught that, but he talked about the young boy, you know, has the fishes and loaves, but nobody knows his name. Or the widow, it's just the widow and the widow's might. And so the fact that, you know, it's, it's not about, you know, the name. It's about getting lost in the offering that God gets all the glory. And that for years and years, people would talk about those stories. And here we were teaching that last week. And how we want to be a part of something that's bigger than us. We want to be a part of something that's, you know, it's about the kingdom of God. It's about God getting the glory. It's not about me getting the glory. It's not about my, me being recognized, but it's about God getting that. And so today, I want us to kind of un unpack what it means to serve, a life of serving. And I could have said, hey, a cheerful servant, not just a cheerful giver, but a cheerful servant. That man gets joy from serving. And so the life of serving, what does that look like? Because most of us oftentimes, when we think of the good life, we think of, hey, we are the ones being served, right? We think, uh, like some of you ladies might be thinking, hey, you know, there's a maid that comes over and does all the cleaning. There's a cook that comes over and does all the cooking, you know, whatever. And so we often think, hey, that's the good life. The good life is when someone is serving me. And the good life is whenever I don't really have to do anything. It's all taken care of for me. They just kind of take care of it. You know, maybe they drive you around or whatever. You think, well, that's the good life. They pick me up in a limousine, they drive me around. I watched a... Uh, uh, an interview one time where they were showing, you know, this professional basketball player's schedule and, and what his life was like and, you know, his day-to-day -day and, you know, the fact that he got up and he had this uh, gourmet meal cooked for him, you know, by his, his you know, live-in cook. And then, then he, you know, he went and he did a workout and then he would come back and he would get a massage and, and then it would be the next thing, you know, this meal cooked, you know, by the chef and, and then he got a nap that afternoon and then he would be back for, you know, whatever, the, you know, the game or whatever. And it was like, man, and a lot of people like, man, that's the life, isn't it? But is it really, you know, is that really the life? And it depends on what you, what you watch and what you buy into. And if you believe what the world says, hey, it's all about somebody serving you. But if you look at what Jesus says, it's about you serving others. And so too often what we do is we buy into the world, even though we claim to be Christians, right? We're, hey, man, we're believers, we're followers of Christ. But really, our whole mentality of the good life is someone serving us. And so I want us to look at what Jesus has to say about this is we enjoy the good life when we we follow the example of Jesus when we follow Jesus example and we go you know what, I want to I want to I want to live like Jesus did I want to have that mentality so we begin to experience that when we do what he did here's what he did so before the Passover celebration Jesus knew that his hour had come 
to leave this world and return to his father. So Jesus knows what's about to happen, right? He knows that the cross is in front of him. He knows that he is headed to this cross, but he knows that, you know, the father is going to take care of everything. And he knows there's pain involved. He knows there's anguish involved. He knows there's suffering involved. He knows all that. But he knew that God had a plan. And he trusted God's plan. Sometimes we don't trust God's plan. We want to make everything work out the way that we think. And we don't trust God's plan. But Jesus trusted God's plan. So we've got to trust it as well. So he had loved his disciples during his ministry on earth. And now he loved them to the very end. In other words, he knows that his time on earth is drawing to an end. He's going to make a difference going to the cross. Bleeding out his precious blood for you and for me. For my sins and for your sins. For their sins. And man, he knows how it's coming. And he's going he's to breathe his last breath. It was time for supper, and the devil had already prompted Judas, son of Simon Iscariot, to betray Jesus. And Jesus knew that the Father had given him authority over everything, and that he had come from God and would return to God. So Jesus knew all this. So he knows where he's going. He, I mean, he, he is focused on the cross. He knows where he's going. He knows that there has to be this, this ultimate sacrifice that will cover the sins of all mankind. And he knows, you know what, the Father has given him authority over everything, over sin, death, the grave, everything. And he can, he can defeat that. He knows the Father's plan. And he knows he's going to return to God. So he got up from the table and he took his robe, took off his robe and he wrapped a towel around his waist. And he poured water into a basin and then began to wash the disciples' feet, drying them with the towel he had around him. And so when we look at that passage there, we, we, we go, all right, so here's Jesus who had left the Father. The scripture just said that, that he had left the Father and he was going to return to the Father. So here's Jesus who left heaven and had all of that to come here to go to a cross. He knew where he was going. But he also was going to model what it was to serve. And so he gets down and he, he, he literally takes off his robe and he ties his towel around his waist. And he gets down and he begins to wash the dirty feet of disciples. Now this was not an elite group. You know what I'm saying? I mean this is, this is fishermen. This is tax collectors. These are kind of in some ways kind of the outcast and kind of the, you know, the, the common Joe, if you will. And so here Jesus is, the King of kings and Lord of lords, getting on his knees and pouring water over their feet and, and washing their feet and literally drying them off with a towel that he has around his waist. And if you know the story, Peter's like, you know, Jesus, you're not washing my feet. I'm talking about a picture of humility. Here is the King of kings and Lord of lords saying, hey, listen, this is what must happen. So he gets down. And he knows, you know, he's setting a tone. He's setting a pace for his guys to follow. And Peter's like, Jesus, you're not washing my feet. And he goes, Peter, if I don't wash your feet, then you don't have any part in me. And so, so Peter's like, well, don't just wash my feet, but wash my head and my hands and, and wash my whole body. And Jesus goes, Peter, you're, you're missing this. You don't, you don't understand what this is about yet. But he's, hey, listen, you've got to be willing to follow me. No matter what I do, you've got to be willing to follow me. And say, so here's the thing, we want enough, we want the good parts of Jesus, right? We want the good parts of Jesus, like, hey, heaven, that's a good part, right? We go, man, we get Jesus, we get heaven, we get Jesus, we get forgiveness, we're good with those things. But when Jesus says, hey, listen, I want you to be a suffering servant, we're like, man, I don't know about that part. And so Jesus, hey, listen, Peter, you don't understand what you're saying, but I'm just telling you, if you're going to be a part of me, you've got to be willing to, you got to be willing to serve. If you really want to be a follower of Christ, you've got to be willing to say, you know what, I'm willing to serve, and it's not about me, it's not about my agenda, but it's about what you want. And so dropping down to verse 12, it says, after washing their feet, he put on his robe again and sat down and asked, do you understand what I was doing? So he's asking the whole group now, he's like, hey, listen, all right, guys, I want, I want to ask you. Obviously, Peter didn't know exactly what was going on. He said, so do you guys understand what I was doing? He, so he's asking them, he's teaching them. And, and, and so he, he makes it clear that, hey, listen, I'm giving you a model to follow. He says, you call me teacher and Lord, and you're right because that's what I am. He said, hey, you call me this, and you're right. But look, he says, and since I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you ought to wash each other's feet. I have given you an example to follow, so do as I have done to you. So in other words, what Jesus is saying, listen, guys, you know, I know a lot of times people have this mentality that, Hey, if you get in certain circles, then you've got to be about being in the lead, but sometimes you've got to be about serving. And we call them servant leaders, right? We've got to be willing to wash the feet of the people around us. And so Jesus said, hey, I've given you an example to follow. And so Jesus said, listen, I want you to follow me by doing what I do. And I'm sure that the disciples, like I said, they were 
Peter was, you know, he was rebuking Jesus. I mean, he was indignant. You know, he's like, hey, this is not going to happen. You're not going to wash my feet. That, that, that's not your position. That is not your role. You know, that's below you. And Jesus is saying, hey, listen, if you want to follow me, you've got to be willing to do what's below you. You've got to consider others more important than you. Your position, your status, whatever it might be. He says, I tell you the truth, slaves are not greater than their master, nor is the messenger more important than the one who sends the message. He's making it pretty clear here. Now that you know these things, God will bless you for doing them. And so what Jesus is saying, listen, if you really want to follow me, and, and then you've got to be willing to do everything that I do. And oftentimes, like I said, you know, we, we want the good stuff, but we're not sure about that serving stuff, and we're not sure about that suffering stuff, and we're not sure about you know, persecution, and we're not sure about other things that may come. But he says, hey, if you're going to follow me, you've got to be willing to follow me on everything. And he, and he tells the disciples that, you know, hey, listen, man, just follow the example. So we enjoy the good life when we, sit, when we serve like Jesus. We begin to experience the good life. And some of you guys, maybe you've never experienced the good life, and you keep thinking it's somewhere out there, and you're thinking, hey, it's going to be somebody serving you. And Jesus said, hey, listen, it's not that way at all. It's about you serving others. It's about you saying, hey, listen, I want to serve others. I want to serve them. You know, too often we, you know, like I said, we, when we do serve, we, you know, we want everybody to know it. You know, Jesus was made, made it pretty clear. He, he was humble. And so, you know, it's kind of like some of the husbands in the room, probably whenever you wash the dishes, you go, you, you tell your wife, hey, listen, I just want you to know I wash the dishes. I don't know if you noticed that, but I'm just going to point it out, right? That's not humility, guys. I'm just saying that's not humility. That's, that's, uh, that's manipulation and sometimes trying to leverage things rather than just doing it because you want to serve your spouse. And really, we should have that mentality. Hey, how do I serve my spouse? We should ask ourselves that every day. You know, if you're married, hey, how do I serve my spouse? You know, and, and so for some of you ladies, it's not you going, hey, listen, I just want you to know I washed and folded all these clothes and I put them away since you can't seem to do that. That's, that's not really humble either. You know what I'm saying? And I'm sure that probably happens in your house sometimes as well. But humble, you know, is what Jesus modeled. And so whenever we're, we're humble, we're, you know, we, we do it with humility. And we do it because, you know what, it's an opportunity to serve. And it's an opportunity to be the hands and feet of Jesus. It's not for recognition. It's not so that we can get an attaboy. It's not so that, you know, you know, we can say, well, I did this, so you have to do that. And it's not manipulation or leveraging. It's serving. And so serving is not manipulation. And serving is not leveraging something. It's doing it because Christ did it. It's serving because that's what we're called to do. And, and we, we have to get past the mentality that me serving other people is not a good thing. We've got to get to the point where we understand that Jesus said humbly serving others is a God thing. It really is the best thing. It's a good thing. You know? And so, so Jesus was humble. Here's another. He was compassionate. So we see over and over that Jesus was compassionate towards people. You know, he would see people that were hurting, and man, he, he wanted to heal them. You know, there would be people crying out, you know, son of, son of David, have mercy on me. You know, and he would give them sight, or he would heal their, their physical, you know, uh, situation. He would touch them and heal them. He would give them sight. He would give them hearing. Man, he would heal them. He would hang out with lepers. You know, you heard, you heard uh, him talking last week, Ken, talking about he was at Simon the leper's house. You know, Jesus would heal people of leprosy. And so Jesus cared about people. He showed compassion. You know, he, he literally, you know, as he's walking up on Jerusalem, he looks upon Jerusalem. He says that he wept because he, he saw them as like sheep without a shepherd. He, he wept over Jerusalem. And so he had compassion for the people. He saw us as helpless like sheep without a shepherd. I think about the woman at the well. You know, too often, you know, we see people and we go, man, their life is so jacked up. They're, they're so messed up and I mean, I don't even know what they're thinking, you know. And Jesus saw this woman coming to the well in the middle of the day. Her life is, is in chaos. You know, she's, she's had multiple relationships, multiple marriages. She's not even living with her husband at the time. And, and so Jesus kind of speaks to her. And that was kind of a big deal because she's coming out there in the middle of the day, in the heat of the day to avoid the crowds. And Jesus has this conversation with her. And he shows compassion to her. And he, te he, he tells her about true worship. And he tells her about him being the son of God. And and then he tells her to go and tell everyone what she's seen and heard. And, you know, and he'd been telling everybody else, you know, like the disciples would see stuff. And he'd say, hey, don't tell anybody. And they would be like, what? You know, and so he would heal somebody. Hey, listen, don't, heal, don't tell anybody. But with her, this woman, this, this Samaritan woman, he said, hey, listen, I want you to go tell everybody what you've seen. And so she becomes the first evangelist telling everybody what she's seen and heard. And so Jesus showed her great compassion, right? And so Jesus 
was humble and he was compassionate. And I love this. He was intentional. He was intentional in teaching moments, you know, and he was intentional about who he told to do things. He was intentional about telling them not to do things. Don't tell anybody. You know, and so Jesus was intentional about serving. And so oftentimes, you know, we, we go, you know, I'm, I'm not necessarily humble, but we should be. And compassionate means that we're concerned about someone else. It's not about me. It's about me saying, you know what, I want to be like Jesus where I'm, I'm asking how do I serve them? How do I bless them? How do I encourage them? I, I was sharing with the first service this morning. I was walking down the hallway, you know, and, and, and just little things, you know, ways that we serve. We often wonder, you know, what are some ways that I can serve? You know, and oftentimes we ask, you know, hey, you know, what are some ways I can serve somebody? You know, we will give you a few ideas, like maybe cut somebody's grass, or maybe you, you know, you take their trash can up for them, or, or maybe you, you, you know, I don't know, you let somebody go ahead of you that only has a couple of items and uh, at a grocery store, just something, or maybe you bless somebody with an extra tip, or maybe you pay for somebody's meal, but little things like that. But a simple way, like this morning, I, I, I had been in here to watch the first baptism that took place in the first service, and. And uh, celebrated that with the church. And anyway, so I'm walking in the hallway and this guy comes walking up. He's got this big smile on. And he goes, Pastor, he said, I just wanted to tell you that today lives are going to be changed today. He said, I just wanted to encourage you. And he's got this big smile. I can't help but smile back. You know, you're like, dude, that's awesome. And I said, I, you know what? I believe that and I receive that. I said, I believe that lives are going to be changed today by the power of the gospel and God's word going forward. Right? Don't y'all believe that? I believe that. And, and so as, as he's encouraging me. I'm thinking, you know what, he, did? he just served me. I mean, I'm getting up to teach everybody. And he said, hey, listen, lives are going to be changed. I believe that. And he's got this big smile on his face. And I walk upstairs and our prayer team's up there. And they begin to pray over me. And I just hear the words that they're speaking over me. And I'm like, you know what, they're encouraging me. So one of the most strategic, intentional things that we can do is to speak words of encouragement to people. And we serve them by encouraging them. By speaking life over them. And believing in them. And trusting them. And so, you know, here at Jesus, you know, he's, he's humble, he's compassionate, he's intentional. You know, he's taken this opportunity to get down and to show these guys, hey, listen, there can't be anything below you. There can't be anybody below you. And a lot of times that's what we battle, right? We see people as being a little bit below us. We like to feel like they're a little bit below us because that makes us feel better about ourselves. And I'm just telling you, that's a little wonky, that's messed up. And so what we do is we think, well, if I can find something wrong with them, it makes me feel better about myself, Right? You may not want to admit that, but that's what we do. We look for something wrong with somebody. The way they dress, the way they act, the way they do things. Because we can find something wrong with them, it makes us feel better about ourselves, which is really messed up. But Jesus says to consider others really better than ourselves, more important than ourselves. And so we, we have to have the attitude that Jesus had here. We have to have the attitude of Christ. And so if we have the attitude of Christ, then we begin to look at people from a different perspective. And so... Instead of looking down on people, we look for ways to serve people. Instead of looking for what's wrong in somebody, we look for what God is doing in their life, what's right. And we start celebrating those positive things, right? The, we start speaking life over that person. So look at what it says here in Philippians. This is Paul writing to the church there. He says, is there any encouragement from belonging to Christ? I would say yes, wouldn't y'all? That's what he's asking. He's asking you a question. Is there any encouragement from belonging to Christ? I was encouraged by the brother of the day. I was encouraged by the prayer team this, you know, this morning. And so I would say this, that I'm encouraged to know that, you know what, my sins have been forgiven, that my name is written in the Lamb's Book of Life, and if I breathe my last breath, I breathe my first breath of heaven, and I have a peace that passes understanding, and I'm okay with my relationship with God, that I, and I know that, you know what, that Jesus has made me right with Him. So I am encouraged with that. And I hope that you are. That's what, Paul, that's what Paul is saying. Hey, listen, you guys there in Philippi, any encouragement from knowing about Christ? Absolutely, right? We celebrate that. We worship who He is. And we celebrate that He has given us this. It says, any comfort from His love? Do, do you feel the, the comfort of knowing that God loves you? See, too often what we do is we feel like, man, I'm just a failure. You know, I've messed up. I've blown it. I'm a mistake. And we don't ever get our mind around how much God loves us. And, you know, and John 3.16 tells us that, but we've heard that, and, and it's kind of like, yeah, but, you know, but, but, Mike, I have messed up so much, and, God, I've messed up so much, and I know everybody thinks the worst of me, but God thinks the best of you, and He loves you. He has an incredible love for you. And so what if instead of whenever you go to Him in prayer, instead of feeling like I've got to apologize for everything, He says, hey, listen, I just want to hug you. Man, I just want to love on you. I know what you've done. I know everything that you thought. I know everything that you said. I love you. And I can forgive you. 
And so too often we, we see God as looking at us as a failure and as a mistake and that we've blown it whenever actually he's saying, hey, listen, man, I'm crazy about you and I love you. And so Paul is saying, any, any comfort from his love? I hope so. Any fellowship together in the Spirit? He's going, hey, listen, man, have you, have you experienced the power of the Holy Spirit at work in your life? Do, have, do you know what it's like whenever you feel that quickening of your spirit, that God is working in you? He's, he's bringing conviction over certain things. And, man, he's bringing you together with people. And, man, you can feel the presence of God. You can just feel the fellowship of the Spirit among you. He's going, any, any comfort in that? Any fellowship in that? Like this morning, I was in the back, and one of our ushers walked up, and he said, man, he said, you can feel God's Spirit in here. He goes, and I believe that people know that God is doing things in here. And I'm like, I agree with you, brother. And so what did we do? We had fellowship together in the Spirit back there, talking about the, God, the fact that God's Spirit was at work in here. And so what Paul is writing, and he's asking them, and I would ask you, are you experiencing that? Are, are your hearts tender and compassionate? Remember we talked about being compassionate. Are your hearts tender and compassionate towards people? Or do you have a hard heart? Are you trying to find everything that's wrong with everybody else? Are you trying to justify how you feel and why you feel the way that you do? Rather than saying, God, I want to have a tender heart towards people. God, I want to love people the way that you love them. And I want to serve people the way that you, you serve. And so that ought to be our mentality. Because I believe that's the good life. Because when we begin to say, you know what, God, give me a heart to see people as you see them and to love them as you love them. But to, he's asking these questions, man, look at this. He says, they make me truly happy by agreeing wholeheartedly with each other, loving one another and working together with one, with one mind and purpose. He said, hey, listen, be unified and make it about the kingdom of God and not really about yourself, but about the kingdom of God and the gospel of Jesus Christ going forward and the building up of the body of Christ and making sure that the message is unified. He said, hey, be, be intentional about these things. Don't be selfish and don't try to impress others, but be humble, thinking of others as better than yourselves. And so what Paul is saying, hey, listen, man, you got to be willing to say, hey, listen, it's not about me. And it's not about my comfort. And it's not about everybody serving me. But it really is about serving others. He says, don't be selfish. And that's what we wrestle with the most probably, right? Is being selfish. And so whenever we say, God, I, I don't want to be selfish. I want the Spirit of God to convict me of that. And I want to die to that. One of the best ways to die to that is to put others first and begin to serve them. Be humble thinking of others as better than yourselves. In other words, to view them as, you know what? They are who I need to be serving, not them serving me. And don't look out only for your own interest, but take an interest in others too. In other words, what do I have to gain in this? What do I get out of this? It's really, it's about, you know, how do I give in this? How do I bless in this? How do I speak life over someone? It says, you must have the same attitude that Christ Jesus had. Though he was God, he did not think of equality with God as something to cling to. I mean, here, Paul is saying, hey, listen, we've got to have the attitude of Christ. You know what? It's not about me gaining or, or gathering everything. It's about me surrendering everything. Instead, he gave up his divine privileges. He took the humble position of a slave and was born as a human being. And so here, what Paul is saying, hey, listen, Jesus was in heaven with the Father, and he left all of that. He left his divine privilege to come here, going to a cross that he knew he was headed to, right? Going to a cross, to a Roman cross, to bleed out his precious blood so that his blood would be able to cover the sins of the people of this world. And he would, he would literally bleed out his precious blood to pay for your selfishness and your greed and my, je my greed and my jealousy and my anger and my resentment and my bitterness and, and whatever the sin it might be. That's what Jesus went to the cross for. But he left his divine privilege to literally come here to provide a way for us to have a right relationship with the Father. And, and so what Paul is saying, hey, listen, we have to have that mentality that it's not about just being okay and everything being plush. It's about making sure that the right thing is done and that we're putting others first. So that's what Jesus did. He took on the position of a slave. And when he appeared in human form, he humbled himself in obedience to God and died a criminal's death on a cross. And so what Paul is saying, he became a slave. You know, and a slave has that negative connotation. But for us, that is what our Lord and our Savior, our, 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 our King, became. And then he took on the position of a human or the appearance of a human. He, he literally became one of us so that he could tell the message of the gospel, the good news, so that he could heal us of our brokenness, whether it be physical, emotional, relational, spiritual, whatever it might be, he could heal us of those things. And so he modeled all this. He lived a, a perfect life here. And so 
We enjoy the good life when we use our spiritual gifts to help others because that's what Jesus did. Jesus used everything that he, he had to help others, to provide a way. He is the way maker. He, he provided a way for there to be salvation to all who would believe, right? And for the, all of us in this room that have put our faith in Christ, we go, you know, God, praise God that you loved us that much. We're getting close to Easter, right? Easter's coming up. And I love Easter. I don't know about you, but I love Easter because, man, I'm, I'm reminded that there's an empty tomb, that Jesus defeated death, he defeated the grave, he defeated hell, and he defeated sin. And he offers to me, and he offers to you, and all who will put their faith in him, salvation. There's no other way to be in a right relationship with God except through our faith in what Christ has done on the cross and through the power of the resurrection. And when we believe with everything that's in us, it changes us from the inside out. And so whenever we look at that, we go, Jesus used his gifts to help others. He used everything that he had. And so what God is telling us is that we're to use our gifts. So God has given us gifts to help each other. And if you're a believer, if, if you're able to celebrate Easter with that type of excitement, that you go, you know what, I know that, you know, that tomb is empty. I know that I am redeemed. I know that I'm a child of God. I know that I'm part of the family of God. I know that I am His. If you know that, then here's the thing. You have to know that there's a spiritual gift that God has given you. And He has placed within you that spiritual gift to be used to help others and to help build up the body of Christ. And so if you have placed your faith in Christ, if you have surrendered your life to Jesus, then it says that he has sealed you with the Holy Spirit until the day of redemption. Kind of like a king putting his, his wax seal, and he has sealed you with the Holy Spirit until the day of redemption. Not to be broken. And so if you have the Spirit of God living within you, then you also have a spiritual gift or a spiritual endowment that is used for building up others and building up the body of Christ. And so our job is to help others. And so the question is, is what are we doing with what we've been gifted with, right? You know, so the good life is whenever I am doing what Jesus did, I'm humbly and compassionately and intentionally serving others. And, and so when we serve God, we do that. So look at this. It says there are different kinds of spiritual gifts, but the same spirit is the source of them all. There are different kinds of service, but we serve the same Lord. And so that scripture is saying, hey, listen, it all comes from the Holy Spirit. If you have the gift of the Holy Spirit within you that comes through salvation, through you putting your faith in Christ, you have the Spirit living within you, then you have a gift. And so again, th there are different kinds of spiritual gifts. Some are for teaching. Some are hospitality. Like this morning, we had people that were in the parking lot or as greeters that were smiling. Hey, listen, welcome to Journey Church. We're glad you're here today. And they're using their gift of hospitality. And they're saying, hey, listen, I just want to be used by God. But they don't just use it here. They use it everywhere they go. And, and they have this mentality, hey, how do I make people feel welcomed? How do I make people feel desired and wanted? Man, how do I do that? And so they use that gift. There's people that have the gift of teaching. Man, they use that to teach and to share. Hopefully, moms and dads, we take every opportunity we can to teach our children intentionally about the Word of God. When we're sitting down at the table, we're thinking of ways to teach the Word of God. Whenever we're going along the road, the Bible says, we're try trying to think of ways to teach our children about the Word of God and how, what God's plan and purpose is for their life. Whenever we're laying down at night, man, when maybe you're, you're getting ready to go to bed, you're, you're telling stories about how God can, can change their life and how He wants to lead them and guide them. You're taking those opportunities to teach. And so are you using your gifts? They all come from the same Spirit. It says there's, there are different kinds of service, but we serve the same Lord. So you may have different ways of doing that. And, you know, the, the people this morning that were praying, they used their gift of prayer. Yesterday morning we were in here. We walked up and down these aisles praying over every chair in here. We didn't know who was going to be sitting here today. But we prayed over these chairs because we prayed for God to bless. And we prayed for God to draw people here that wanted to hear the gospel, that needed to hear the gospel. That lost people would be saved. And that people would use their spiritual gifts. So we had a team of people that were literally walking over every step of this building, praying and using their spiritual gift to pray literally the demonic junk out of here and God's stuff in here. That's literally what we were praying. And so they're using their gifts, praying for you, praying blessings over you, praying for God to give you ears to hear and eyes to see. And so all of that is to serve the same Lord. We serve the same Lord. God works in different ways, but it is the same God who does the work in all of us. A spiritual gift is given to each of us so that we can help each other. There it is again, right? It's about helping each other. And so you know, prayer teams in here using their gift of prayer to pray over you and pray blessings over you. You know, some people use the gift of hospitality. Some people use the gift of teaching. You know, there's people, we prayed over, you know, everybody that's in that, that sound booth back there and on these cameras and back up there with the production team and every teacher that would be here. Everybody that's on this worship team, we prayed over them by name. 
And why would we do that? Because we want to help them be all that God wants them to be. And so that's why we do that. So we use these gifts to help each other. And so here's the thing. If you have the Holy Spirit, you have a spiritual gift. If you're sitting in this room, if you're watching online, you know that Jesus lives within you. And you know that the Holy Spirit is there. Then you have a spiritual gift. And so the question is, what are you doing with it? Are you using it? Are you using it to build up the body of Christ? Are you using it to help others? You know, are you using it to be a witness for, for the gospel? And so if you're not using it, you're missing out on what Jesus taught us to do. First Peter says, God has given each of you a gift from his great variety of spiritual gifts. Use them well to serve one another. Use them well. It doesn't say to sit on them. It doesn't say to kind of put them away for a rainy day. He says, use them well to serve for another day, to serve one another. Use them well to serve one another. Every chance you can, not just on Sunday morning, but as you're doing life. Do you have the gift of speaking? Then speak as though God himself were speaking through you. Do you have the gift of helping others? Then, man, what do you do? You help them, right? I love this one. Do you ha- then speak as though God is speaking through you. Do you have the gift of speaking? Y'all know people that you feel like they have the gift of speaking? Now, I'm not talking about just rambling. Because a lot of people can just talk and talk and talk. And you're like, dude, will you ever shut up? I mean, good gracious, you know. But there are some people that have the gift of speaking that when they speak, people are motivated, they're inspired, they're encouraged. And what the Bible is, hey, listen, man, if you can encourage people, if you can speak life over them, then do it. Then speak life over them. Don't just use a lot of words. Use the right kind of words and the best words and, and, and speak life over them. If you have the gift, man, certainly do it with all the strength and energy that God supplies. Then everything you do will bring glory to God through Jesus Christ. All glory and power to Him forever and ever. Amen. It's about Him. It's not about me. It's not about you. It's about me saying, hey, God, here I am. Use me. Use me. God, you've given me a gift. God, I want to use it for your glory. God, I, I want to teach or I want to serve or I want to do whatever. God, I just want to be in the center of your will. I want to be where you want me to be. And God, that is the good life. God, that is the good life. And that's where I want to be. I want to be in the center of your will. And so we, we see there's all kinds of gifts, right? So what are we going to do? Are we going to use them for God's glory? It was kind of a cool thing happened last week. I had a, a young couple that messaged me, and they said, uh, hey, Pastor, you know, we're going to be there Sunday and just wanted to meet you if we could. Uh, and they're, they're missionaries in, in Zambia, uh, Africa. And uh, I told them, hey, man, it'd be a great week to be here. I said, Ken Gallion is going to be speaking. He has a ministry called Call to Africa, and he works in Zambia, and it'd be a, a good time for you guys to meet. So after the service, they came down, and they've just got this little, like, hey. <laughs> I mean, they just have this joy about them. It's like, that's awesome. And so they came down, and I introduced them to Ken, and they got to talking, and Ken was talking about, you know, some of the work they do in Zambia and where they were at. And so these guys are up in kind of like the northwest part of Zambia. And, uh, and anyway, I ended up meeting with them this past week and just wanted to find out a little bit more about what God was doing in them and through them. And you know what they were doing? They were serving. They're, they're, they're so excited about serving the people in Zambia. And let me tell you, they live out in the bush. And, and, and but I want you, I'm fixing to show you a video where we sat down and talked, but I want you just to see the joy in them and the excitement of them about serving others. Check this out. So 2017 is when we got the call. Right now we're just um, preaching the gospel, discipleship. Uh, we have farming um, practices that we help with, uh, water well repair. Our house where we sleep and everything is inside of a tent. It's pretty good sized tent, but it's it's yeah. a tent. So oh, when yeah. it's hot outside, it's hot inside. When it's cold outside, it's cold inside. We work amongst the clinics uh, and just various different things, but our primary goal is discipleship and evangelism. If we have the funds for the other stuff, it'll accompany it. And if we don't, we're out there preaching the gospel. The whatever it takes is where obedience falls under that category as well. And it's like, we just do what the Lord's called us to. And then it's hard at first and there's challenges, but it's so rewarding and so fulfilling just when you say yes. So we really want to move where the, Lord, where the Lord's moving and, and walk step by step with Him. It was hard to leave. It was actually very difficult for me in the beginning. And then now that I'm there, I'm like, oh, I couldn't be anywhere else. That's awesome. Well, that's the good life. Mm-hmm. You're in the middle of God's will, and yeah. you're serving. You know, yeah. I saw pictures of you leading <clears throat> Bible studies, and teach, you know, I think one uh, where the ladies were writing songs. Mm-hmm. You, know, you were leading Bible studies. Y'all have night services that are taking place, and um, you know, you're presenting the gospel. You're making disciples. The life of obedience and the life of serving really is the good life. Dude, isn't that awesome? I mean, they live in a tent. They live in a tent, guys. How many of you guys would have said before today, hey, man, the good life is living in a tent in the middle of Africa? Not many of you. But did you hear what, did you hear what Maddie said? 
She said, man, she goes, I, I, I couldn't imagine being anywhere else. She's in the center of God's will. She's using her gifts to teach. And, you know, her, her husband, you know, Derek, he's using his gift to teach. They're teaching people, you know, just farming principles so that they can have a better harvest. Teach them how to repair water wells so they can have clean water. You know, and, and you're sitting there going like, man, they, they gave up everything here. You know where they live? They live in Cocoa Beach, Florida. And, and they gave that up to go and serve where they feel like, you know what, this is where we're supposed to be. This is what we're supposed to be doing. Living in a tent. You know, you, we didn't get it in a video, but she, but she was talking about, you know, the, the zippers broke on her tent. And I, she said, you know, so you kind of have to worry about what animals. And I was like, what kind of animals? You know, it's Africa. And she said, well, mainly we just have to worry about snakes. And I'm like, that's enough. You know, that's enough to worry about. And, and, but just their excitement that they get to go and teach and help write songs about Jesus. And they get to teach them out of God's word. You saw Derek sitting there doing Bible studies. They would do night services and stuff. But they're using their gifts. They're using their gifts. And so let me ask you, are you using your gifts? You might be thinking, Mike, I don't, I don't want to go to Africa. You know, Ken Gagan said the same thing. He said, God, I'll do anything, but I'm not going to Africa. And that's his ministry. It's called Africa, right? And he has a heart for Africa like nobody. So some of you guys are already going, I, I'm not saying anything today because God will end up sending me to Africa. I'm not saying he's going to do that. I think he wants to use you right where you're at. I believe that God wants to use you to serve the people around you. And maybe it is to serve your spouse. Maybe it is to serve your family. Maybe it is to serve your coworker, or maybe it is to serve, you know, somebody, your neighbor, whatever that, that looks like. You've got to go, God, here are my spiritual gifts. God, I want you to teach me what those are. And some of you guys may be sitting here today and go, I don't know what my spiritual gift is. My, all right, well, then you have a responsibility to figure that out. We will help you with that. We want to help you discern what your spiritual gifts are. There's assessments that you can do to figure out, hey, what you're gifted to do. And a lot of that comes from the people around you. They see that gift and they affirm that gift. But the thing is, you got to be willing to say, God, here I am. I surrender. Here I am. I give you my life and I give you these gifts, God. I want you to use them for your purposes and for your kingdom. So a life of obedience is the good life. A life of obedience is me saying, God, here I am. I give you my life. I give you my gifts. God, I give you everything. I just want to be obedient. Like I think about this morning, those who went through the waters of baptism, what they did is they said, hey, listen, I want to follow Christ in obedience. And obedience is a celebration. God the Father looks down. He goes, you know what? They were obedient. They went public. They let everybody know. There are maybe some of you in here today that you need to go public with your salvation. You need to be baptized. You know, well, here's the thing. Baptism doesn't save you, but it is the outward expression of the inward change. And then take that step. Be obedient. Maybe God would say, hey, listen, I have gifted you to do this, and you're not doing anything with your gifts. Then be obedient and do what Jesus taught you, and that's to serve others. And so let's look at this passage here. In His grace, God has given us different gifts for doing certain things uh, well. So if God has given you the ability to prophesy, speak out with as much faith as God has given you. If God's given you that ability, then men, use all the faith that you have to preach the Word of God and to share the Word of God. If your gift is serving others, serve them well. If you're a teacher, teach well. In other words, whatever you do, don't just kind of go halfway. Give it everything you got, man. Give it your best. If your gift is to encourage others, be encouraging. I was so proud of the guy using his gift to encourage me this morning. Hopefully, I have encouraged you to use your gifts for the kingdom today. So if your gift is to encourage others, be encouraging. If it is giving, give generously. Pastor Ken talked about that last week, right? You know, if you, if you feel like your gift is to give, then give. And don't give, you know, with a begrudging heart, but give with a cheerful heart. So give. If God has given you leadership ability, take the responsibility seriously. And if you have a gift for showing kindness to others, do it gladly. In other words, you know, if God has given you the ability to be a leader, then, hey, man, leverage that for the kingdom of God, not for your recognition, not for papers on the wall and recognition, but say, God, I want the kingdom to expand. And if you have a gift for showing kindness to others, do it gladly. If you're one of those people that, man, you just love to make people feel blessed, then do it with a good heart. Don't just pretend to love others. Really love them. Hate what is wrong. Hold tightly to what is good. And what Scripture is saying right there is, hey, listen, don't be a put on. Don't be a fake. But be real. Be authentic and say, hey, listen. And here's the thing. You've got to ask God, God, help me to love people the way that you love them. Because in our flesh, we don't. We love us. We love us, right? We love us. But what, what Scripture says is that we're to die to self and we're to say, God, I want to live for you. And God, I want you to show me how to love people the way you love them. So God, help me to see them the way that you see them. Help me to love them the way that you love them. And so that when we ask God to do that, He will do it. It says, love each other with genuine affection and take delight in honoring each other. So in other words, man, really love people. Don't just tolerate them. 
Don't just, and don't make excuses for not loving them, but say, God, I want to really love people the way that you love people. Never be lazy, but work hard and serve the Lord enthusiastically. Rejoice in our confident hope. Be patient in trouble and keep on praying. So see, the, pray, the prayer team that was praying yesterday, keep on praying. And for some of you that got the gift of praying, you say, hey, listen, I want to be a part of the prayer team. Let us know. You know, there's a card right here that we've got. That, that you guys, take that out real quick. There, there's, a, there's a card in your seat. You should be able to take that out. It's called the good life. And we believe that, hey, you know, whenever you, when you step into the good life, when you start serving that way, you know, God's going to bless you. And we're not doing this because we need you. We're doing this because you, you need to be in the center of God's will. You need to use your gifts. And you need to follow Christ in obedience. So it says on the back, it says, I want to experience the good life by serving. And it's got a place for your name and your phone number. And it's got, it says, I'm interested in serving. And it gives you some of the different areas. And some of these are kind of first serve areas where it's kind of easy to step in, like parking team and greeter team, usher team, and then the cafe team. But then we've got production, students and journey kids. And there may be another area that you're interested in. Some of those you have to qualify for. You have to make sure that you go through a background check because we want that to be a safe place for our kids. You have, there may be some things, some training you have to go through, and you have to qualify. We, we see people using their gifts up here to lead us in worship. Maybe there's some of you sitting out there, and you've got the ability to be able to do something like that. And you go, you know what, I can, I can play an instrument. You know, then try out and see if you make it. And I would just say this, this is not American Idol. If you're not good and you can't do it, we don't stick you up here. We're just going to be straight up with you. You know, you got to be able to lead people, and you got to be able to do it well. And, uh, you know, you can make a joyful noise out there, but if you're going to be up here, you got to be able to do it right. So I'm just saying, that's where we are. And we don't make any apologies for that because we want to honor God. We believe God is honored in excellence. So our life has to be one where we're saying, God, I want to be obedient. Never be lazy, but work hard and serve the Lord enthusiastically. Rejoice in our comfort and be patient in trouble and keep on praying. It says, when God's people are in need, be ready to help them. Always be eager to practice hospitality. Always be eager to practice hospitality. Man, use those. Use those gifts. You know, and so next steps. One of the next steps, I think, for some of you guys is this right here. Fill that card out. If you're watching online, you can text us and say, hey, listen, man, I, I want to use my gifts to serve. Maybe you say, hey, I don't know what my gifts are. All right, then reach out to us and let us help you discover what your gifts are. But stop making excuses and say, you know what, I'm going to start serving. You might say, well, Mike, I'm, I'm old. It's okay. You can serve whatever the, whatever the capacity God allows you to serve. Mike, I'm young. That's all right. We have, we have young people that serve all the time. But you got to be willing to say, you know what, God, I want to do it with the right heart. So get your heart right. Get your heart right. I mean, God will use you to do great things. And then there's some of you, what you really need to do is experience the good life by giving your life to Christ. You just need to realize, you know what? Man, I'm not doing this to, to be saved. You're doing it because you've given your life to Christ. And so for there's some of you, maybe somebody watching online, you've never, you've never put your faith in Christ. You've never been redeemed. You've never been saved and set free. You're still living in bondage, man. You're still believing the lies. But today is the day of salvation for you if you choose to put your faith in Christ. And so maybe for you, that is the decision you need to make today. That's the step, most important step. And so you don't even have a spiritual gift yet if you have not put your faith in Christ. But if you put your faith in Christ, then you do have a spiritual gift. And so maybe you're here today and you go, Mike, man, I want to be saved. I want to know that Jesus lives within me. And I want to know that I am. my name is written in the Lamb's Book of Life. I want to follow Christ in believer's baptism. I want to know without a shadow of a doubt that I am His. Well, then you, you know how you do that? By putting your faith in who Jesus is, what He did on the cross. And you say, Jesus, I, you confess it. You say, Jesus, I'm a sinner. I've messed up. I've blown it. I have messed up. He knows that already, right? That's why He came. And He said, Jesus, I put my faith in you and what you did on the cross and through the power of the resurrection. So with all the faith that I have, Jesus, I believe that you can save me. And Jesus, I want to quit living the way I've been living. That's repentance. Jesus, I want to turn to you and I want to follow you and I want to follow the example that you gave us. And when you do that, by faith, you will be saved. And so if you want to call on Him, that is the most important thing you can do. Here's the, here's the next one. There's a lot of us in this room, and it's to discover my spiritual gifts and use them to help others. There's a lot of believers sitting in this room. What if this many gifts were used this week in our community? I'm just telling you, we'd be, we'd be pushing back the darkness. We would see people come to know Christ. We would see people being made into disciples. We would see people following Christ in believers' baptism because of what these people in this room or those watching online using their gifts, what kind of impact that would have. So, hey, are you, are you tired of sitting on the, on the sidelines? Are you tired of making excuses? Are you ready to make a difference? Then make a decision today. God's already given you what you need. Are you willing to trust Him? I want to give you an opportunity to respond. So if you will, I want to just ask you to bow your heads and close your eyes. 
If you're here today, I mean, you've never put your faith in Christ, man, I hope that you would make that decision. If you're watching online, you've never put your faith in Jesus, let today be the day of salvation. You say, Jesus, I believe that you are the Son of God. I believe that you went to the cross. I believe that you died for me. I believe that you bled out your precious blood to wash away my sins. And so, Jesus, with all the faith that I have, I believe that. And so, Jesus, I'm calling on you. I'm surrendering to you. Jesus, will you come into my life and will you save me? I want to quit living the way I've been living. I want to live for you. That's repentance. So, Jesus, will you, will you save me? And his answer is yes. If you just prayed that prayer, if you don't mind, if you, if you, if you just prayed that, would you just raise your hand and say, Mike, I just prayed that prayer. Anybody in the room, just raise your hand and say, Mike, that's me. I see your hand right there. That's awesome, brother. Welcome to the family of God. Anybody else? Just raise your hand high so I can see it. Raise it high. Back here. All right. I see your hand back there. Welcome to the family of God. There may be somebody online. If you don't mind, text us and let us know that you made that decision. We want to know. We want to walk with you. See, I believe that there's people in this room that are sitting on their gifts. They're not serving. They're not using them. But you know that God's calling you to change today. He's calling you to step up. He's calling you to follow Him. Maybe online, you can text us and say, hey, listen, that's me. I want to give you an opportunity to respond. Worship team's going to come and lead us in a song. The altar's here, and I'm just telling you, there's something special about let, walking in and laying our life on the altar. There's something special about laying something down on that altar and releasing it there. And so I want, to, I want to just ask everybody across the room just to stand. Everybody stand. And if you would, I just want you to respond as the Holy Spirit leads. I trust the Holy Spirit to lead you and to guide you. And I trust Him to draw you. And I, I trust Him to literally tell you what the next step is. Prayer team's going to be here. They'll pray for you. They'll help you with that next step. I just want to challenge you to be obedient. Just trust Him.